Hare Krishna. So today morning we are continuing our discussion on the topic of when bad things happen to good people, how to face adversity, how to grow through pain. This is a three-part series. In yesterday's session I talked about when we turn toward philosophy, how is philosophy to be approached? So I talked about three main points. The pur purpose, person and position. The purpose of philosophy is to essentially help us make sense of the things that don't normally make sense. And for that purpose, we look not just in one sense for rational sense, I want a logical explanation, but things also need to make emotional sense. And then, when philosophy is being talked about or is being used, who is the person using it? What is their nature? What is their character? What is their agenda? That has to be considered. The purpose of philosophy should be to elevate people, not to manipulate people. We talked about how Hiranyakashipu weaponized philosophy to think that the immortality of the soul can be used to acquire power over many lifetimes so that he could punish God with the death sentence. So then, lastly we discuss about the position. Where is a person? What are they thinking? If a person is already afflicted, then the person needs to be comforted and elevated. And if a person is all, uh, feeling very complacent, then they may have to be shown that they are wrong and they need to work on fixing things. So, the philosophy should help the person grow. So today we will talk about the second part here that you know, how do we make sense? So philosophy, the purpose of philosophy is to help make emo logical, rational and emotional sense. And here in this particular verse is the most graphic example of where philosophy, specifically in this context, the philosophy of karma, it makes no sense. Why does it make no sense over here? Because all the characters here are virtuous and how virtuous they are is being indicated over here. Yatra dharma suto raja. That Yudhishthir was so virtuous as to be the son of Dharmaraj. Generally facing, generally speaking, life is always difficult. And when life is difficult, see, there are problems in life. And for facing problems, we have two resources broadly we can say. Well, one resource is our strength or skill in this life. Mm. We need that, isn't it? That's resource one. So, A, in this world there are people who may cheat us and we have to be intelligent enough to understand who is not trustworthy and therefore we don't maybe invest money in Ponzi schemes or whatever. So we have to have a basic level of strength or skill to do well. Mm. But beyond that, resource two, we could say, is piety, is punya. Now we can say, of course, the strength and skill has also come from our past punya. But there is some punya which comes during the course of our life and gives us positive results. So there is the piety which helps us in less visible ways, we can say. Mm -hmm. So, now, beyond that, we could say, the resource three could be God's mercy. Now, of course, you can say that God's mercy is the source of everything, is the source of our skills and the source of our piety. That is true ultimately, but still, we could consider this is slightly different. So specifically, we could put this as three concentric circles. One is that our 
skill in this life. Now we could say strength is also a skill. So that is mentioned over here in terms of Arjuna being extremely expert in Gandivam, Gandiva Bo, uh, Bhima being expert in terms of his physical strength as well as his skill in mace fighting. So we need skill. Then beyond that, we need piety or pious credits. So, and beyond that, we need God's mercy. So, God's mercy can be said to be the source of everything else. And our piety can be said to be the source of our present skills. But still, the skills are something which are more tangible for us. Now, in one sense, piety and skill, both of these can be considered material. Punya is it's invisible, it's adrushta, but still it is considered bhautika, it is considered prakritika, it's material. Now God's mercy is ultimately spiritual. And these three are broad resources with which we can face problems in life. And for somebody whom all three work together, then that person gains success. Broadly speaking, say after India recently won the World Cup, the T20 World Cup, the Indian captain said that you know, it, is, it, is, it was destiny. It was, uh, it was the blessing of God. You know, basically, now if we consider that many of the Indian players are quite talented you know, among the world's players, not just because we are Indians, we like them, but they are very talented players. But you know, it's just talent or skill alone is not enough for winning. There are other factors which also come in. And those factors are the adrushta factors. Those are invisible factors. And those factors also need to work in our favor. Then we get the results. So now, Bhishma is trying to help Yudhishthir make sense of the situation. Make sense how Yudhishthir is of afflicted with a sense of guilt. He is feeling that I did something so terrible. I caused the war and I caused the bloodshed resulting from the war. But Bhishma is expanding his perspective. He said that bad things were done to you again and again and again. And eventually as a result of the unrelenting atrocities that were done to you, you, you were left with no option except to do a bad thing. Sometimes the nature of the world is that we just have no good choice. Somebody may say, you know, I don't want to fight. Okay, I don't want to get into physical violence, I don't even want to get into arguments with people. That's good, we don't want to argue. But if a person is falsely accusing us once, twice, thrice, four times, five times, then sooner or later we may have to stand up for ourselves. We may have to get into an argument. Now we shouldn't be looking for an argument. There are some people who are like that. Hmm? Some people who are just looking for a reason to argue. Hmm? That's not healthy. But at the same time, if our only principle in the relationships is, I don't want to argue with anyone. Well, and the nature of the world is people will walk over us, people will trample us. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. So, we need to stand up for ourselves, sometime or the other. So basically, in relationships we can say that people can be in interactions or when we interact with others, we can be aggressive. Aggressive means we are just looking for an argument. This is a result of rajas. But we can also be passive. Passive means that is a result of tamas. We just don't do anything. We just feel sorry for ourselves. We are resentful. But we don't do anything at all. In between is that we need to be assertive. And that is a matter of sattva. See, sometimes tolerance can be very easily misunderstood. That uh, 
Krishna tells Arjuna, Tam Stitikshaswa Bharata. But what is Krishna saying or implying by saying tolerate? Does Krishna imply, oh the Kauravas had done so many atrocities towards you, just tolerate them and live with it. That is not the tolerance that Krishna is calling Arjuna for. The tolerance being called for is, it is difficult for you to fight against Bhishma and Drona. Arjuna has just said 10 verses earlier, Katham Bhishma Maham Sankhe Dronam Chamadusudana. He says, How can I fight against Bhishma and Drona? He should be Patiyot Sami Pujara Vari Sudana. He says, I should be offering them flowers and respect, not shooting arrows at them. So that's 2.4 and 2.14. Just 10 verses later, Krishna is telling, This is the difficult duty that you have to tolerate. So sometimes, doing bad things happening to us has to be tolerated and sometimes we needing to do bad things has to be tolerated. Now most of us are ready to tolerate the second thing. You know, I'll do bad things and I justify it in the name of God. No, that's not the point here. Sometimes hard decisions are required in life and so bad things doesn't necessarily mean immoral or illegal. I'm using bad things here in the sense that things which we may not be comfortable doing, things which we don't feel good doing. So we need to tolerate and do those things even if it sometimes means hurting someone. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go about hurting others. So basically here what is generally one aspect of philosophy, when I said philosophy helps us to make sense of things that don't make sense. So how does philosophy do that? It does it by expanding our vision. See a bigger picture. So for example, if you consider the philosophy of karma, it is okay, I'm saying this person is such a good person, why so many bad things happening to this person? Okay, expand our vision. That, okay, this person is on a journey, they also lived in the previous life and they did something in the previous life and that could be a result of that. So expanding the vision can be like if we talk in terms of it can be lengthening the vision, it can be deepening the vision, it can be broadening the vision. Hmm? Normally when we expand there are three dimensions, length, breadth and width, width or depth whatever you want to use the word in this context. So philosophy is meant to expand our vision in various ways. So in this case what is happening is Yudhishthir's vision is Yudhishthir's vision oh, you know, it's, he's almost thinking like my desire and then it led to the bloodshed. Therefore I am guilty. It was my desire specifically for the kingdom that led to the bloodshed. Mm -hmm. This is his vision. But what is Bhishma doing? Bhishma is expanding his vision and is saying that how, if we consider a bigger picture, you know, there were series of atrocities done to you. Now it's very interesting throughout this whole analysis. Bhishma does not even once mention how terrible Duryodhan was. That, that wicked Duryodhan, he had tried to disrobe Draupadi, he deserved what, you, what came upon him. He is not going in that direction. And it's significant that even in the Bhagavad Gita, not even once does Krishna mention the, about the atrocities done by the Kauravas. Many people, people have a little bit in the, in the West, you know, people have a bit of, not just aversion, but paranoia, great fear towards any religious text that seems to call for violence. Any religious text. And they feel, okay, Muslims have their Quran and they have the idea of a holy war and Hindus have the Bhagavad Gita and that also calls for war. And they draw a false moral equivalence between the two. 
And the point is, yes, after the Bhagavad Gita was spoken, a war does occur. But the primary purpose of the Bhagavad Gita was not just to get Arjuna to fight. If that had been the purpose, Krishna could have just described the incident of the disrobing of Draupadi. And that would have been enough to get Arjuna's blood to boil. And Arjuna would have pounced on the Kauravas and destroyed them. But Krishna does not take that attack at all in the Bhagavad Gita. Why? Because the Gita's purpose is not so much to give circumstantial reasons for fighting. Oh, they are terrible people, therefore they need to be punished. It is more for universal principles for decision making. How should we act in life? So Bhishma is also taking the same point. Whenever any philosophical discussion happens, it is not based on circumstantial reasons, circumstantial analysis. So circumstantial reasons for fighting or not fighting. Hmm? That is not the purpose of the Gita. And that is also not the tack which is being taken by Bhishma. It is more universal principles for decision making. How are we to make decisions in our life? That is the principle that is being taught here in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Bhagavatam also. So he does talk about, oh, how virtuous you are, so that he can build on the point that actually what happened was terrible for you. And uh, in this purport, which actually anticipates the next verse, he says, this is just the result of time. Now, Kala is considered to be a factor which leads to a lot of consequences. Now, is Kala an independent factor? Prabhupada says that Kala is non different from the Lord. Manyetvam Kalam Ishanam Anadinidhanam Vibhu. Just in the previous chapter, in 1.8.28, Kunti Maharani has, while praying to Krishna, said that, I understand that you are time. Manyetvam Kalam Ishanam. So then, if Krishna is time, then can we say that it is Krishna causing these things? So that is what we will be discussing today. So first I analyzed how, when problems come, we have three resources. That is our will, uh, that is our skill rather. Then there is our past piety. And then beyond that, there is God's mercy. So based on these three factors, when some disaster or distress comes upon us. Now there are three broad factors in this. There is God's will, hmm? there is free will and there is evil. <laughs> so God's will, free will and evil. Now in the Abrahamic religions, evil refers to the being called Satan, who does e who is evil and makes people do evil things. In our tradition, there is no conception of anything like Satan. But free, so it is evil refers to the samskaras, the impressions that are there within either us or others, which make people do bad things even almost against their conscious will or their better intelligence or whatever. I'll explain this gradually. So when something bad happens in our life, it is important that we analyze carefully what is the cause of this suffering. Hmm. And hey, say if I put my hand in fire. If I am not attentive, say I am sitting in a place which is very cold and that's why some kind of traditional setting that the fire has been put nearby to put heat. And then I don't uh, 
pay due attention and just move my hand and the hand goes toward the fire and my hand gets burnt now is that burning due to god's will well no it's it's my present action mm. say if on a cold night somebody eats a dozen ice creams a and then the next morning they'll say i scream <laughs> they'll feel like screaming their throat will be so sh so sore now if they got a terrible throat is that because of their past karma well yes past night's karma not past life's karma <laughs> is it it so basically when things happen it is important that we don't take one statement in isolation so for example there's a statement that our happiness and distress are determined by destiny yes that is definitely true but then scripture also tells us that yehi samsparsha jab hoga dukha yona yavati the more we indulge in sense pleasure the more we suffer so what does that mean if somebody drinks a lot and they have a terrible hangover a splitting headache and they become dysfunctional was that play misery made by destiny no it was by their decision to drink too much isn't it so can our present actions increase our distress if destiny has fixed happiness and distress then does it mean even if a person does terrible things there will there will be no increase in suffering because of their terrible actions no actions do have consequences isn't it so if our present actions can increase our distress then happiness and distress are a duality and can our present actions not increase our happiness for example another point is satvam sukhe sanjayati the bhagavatam says that through sattva guna happiness comes so if somebody consciously cultivates a sattvic lifestyle in this life and maybe they were eating very spicy food very oily food very unhealthy food and they start following a sattvic diet and their body feels fitter they feel lighter overall they feel better so was that happiness destined does that mean that our habits in this life are worthless are good habits of no use it isn't is not that simple so for example I, i'll give these are called not contradictions but paradoxes paradoxes means apparent contradictions and the thing which i am trying to do over here is that we are trying to understand the complexity of reality so three paradoxes i'll give an example of first is destiny determines happiness and distress which are fixed mm -hmm. that's one statement but the opposite is that sense indulgence sense gratification leads to distress mm -hmm. sattva guna brings happiness so this is a different statement so does that mean that uh, the rajoguna tamoguna or sattva guna choice in our lifetime will make no difference another thing which you could say that our life span is fixed specifically people say a number of breaths are fixed hmm? Hmm? that is one statement but then in contrast we have ayurveda now the very meaning of ayurveda is the veda the knowledge that will increase our ayu if our life span is fixed then how can our life span be increased and how can the same tradition which has said that our life span is fixed also give rise to a systematic body of knowledge that states that that whose express purpose is to increase our life span 
So, this is the second point. Now, third point if we consider is that not a blade of grass moves without the will of God. Now, there is this Gita Sar which is put in many places, which says, one sentence there is Jo hua wo achcha hua Jo ho raha hai wo achcha ho raha hai Jo hone wala hai wo bhi achcha hi hoga Whatever happened was good Whatever is happening is good Whatever will happen will be good Now I have read the Gita over a dozen times Recited it over a hundred times I have friends who have recited the Gita more than a thousand times But none of us Have ever Been able to find Any verse that comes close to this That whatever happens is good you know it's it's not a philosophically correct statement or the textually correct statement because the Gita's focus is not on whether what is happening is good or not the Gita's focus is on whether what we are doing is good or not Arjuna wants to know Puchami Tvam Dharma Sammudha Chetaha that Pucha I I want to know what is the right thing to do. So, one statement is God controls everything. God plans everything. God controls that everything that happens is good because ostensibly it is God's plan. Mm -hmm. Now, versus now God controls everything, we might say something like 9-10, Maya Adhyakshena Prakriti. Everything happens under my supervision. But then, the same Krishna in the, th in the fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita very categorically declares na datte kasya chit papam na chaiva sukrutam vibho agyane navrutam jnanam te na muhiyanti jantavaha so Prabhupada is also very categorical in explaining this verse this is in the fifth chapter the fifth chapter six, verses 11 to 15 are very relevant to what we are discussing here but let's look at this particular verse it's the 15th verse na datte adatte means to accept kasya chit papa krishna says that i don't accept na chaiva sukrutam vibho when people do good people do bad that is their own doing agyane navrutam jnanam te na muhyanti jantavaha so God controls everything there are people's misdeeds people's wrongdoings people's wrongdoings are not God's doings people's wrongdoings are not God's doings that means, say, sometimes we say everything that happens is actually done by God. Hmm? And that is an oversimplification. Why? They consider the disrobing of Draupadi. Now, Krishna intervened to protect Draupadi at that time. But if we say Krishna is the doer of everything, then was it Krishna? Who through Dushasana was disrobing Draupadi? That's a horrendous thing to even consider. That was not Krishna's doing. That was Dushasana's doing. So now Krishna allowed it to happen. And we'll discuss why he allowed it to happen. But the point over here is that there are times in this world when, so we go back to these three things, there is so, so to say that everything is done by God, that is a misunderstanding. And if everything is not done by God, that the bad things are done by bad people, then we can't say that the bad things are good. Bad things are bad. So there is a key difference between saying that everything that happens is good and is for good. It is everything that happens need not be good, but it can be for good. That means good.
can come out of whatever bad has happened in the world now that bad may have happened because of free will that means we ourselves made some mistake or it can be because of evil that some bad person did some terrible thing and because of that that something happened so for example say when the whole gambling match happened we could say you is yudhishthira responsible well yes at one level the mahabharat does not idealize characters the mahabharat gives a very realistic pi picture of characters now in the bhagavatam there is often the focus on the leela explanation that everything is ultimately the leela of the lord parikshit maharaj was cursed because that was the plan of the lord so that the bhagavatam could be spoken and that is true definitely so yudhishthira maharaj gambled so that ultimately how krishna protects his devotees could be demonstrated hmm? so everybody was orchestrated at that time the way yudhishthira acted the way bhishma acted all of them acted in such a way that ultimately this particular principle of how krishna protects his devotees can be demonstrated now is that a valid explanation of course it's a valid explanation as i said yesterday i discussed you know there can be and i won't have time to go into all this but the past times of the lord can be approached at four different levels mm. there is a literal level this is based on bhaktivinod thakur talks about this no he doesn't use the acronym but he talks about chaitanya shiksha there is a literal level there is ethical level there is a allegorical level and there is a devotional level so the devotional level is where we look at the leela oh this is all the lord's arrangement to fulfill his purpose which is of course true but at ethical level we need to consider motivations and situations at a ethical level we consider okay this person was in this situation and this person did like this okay what were they thinking when they did something like this was they thinking right if i had been in that situation would i also been pressured to do something similar so the point is that the, this ethical perspective also to be considered and from the ethical perspective we could say that yudhishthir did make a mistake mm -hmm. now yudhishthir himself says that initially when he started gambling it was completely out of a intention to respect the instruction of his elders that dhritarashtra was like a father figure for him and dhritarashtra had called him to gamble through another father figure vidura so initially so if you say yudhishthir is yudhishthir's motives for gambling if we consider now this is if we carefully read the mahabharata itself it happens initially it was deference deference means basically respectfulness deference or obedience oh my elders have told me to do it my seniors have told me to do it so i'll do it hmm? it started with that but after some time he it became despair you know it was not despair that i want to win it was not greed but right at the beginning only he had told duryodhana why do you want to steal from me the wealth that is meant for the service of the brahmanas he didn't want wealth for his own enjoyment he wanted to do service with that wealth but then as that wealth was being taken away from him one by one by one by one then he started becoming desperate i have to take care of my family i have to take care of the kingdom i have to serve the brahmanas i need to have something even if one one round i win now i'll have something but so later on when talking with draupadi yudhishthir is it is his humility that he acknowledges that i got carried away at that so it was not greed it was not addiction it was a terrible situation that came and now is yudhishthir at fault well of course yudhishthir is at fault we can't say that he is not at fault but is yudhishthir the only one at fault of course not there's a whole scheme the whole match was rigged first of all now yudhishthir playing against shakuni it's like a you know a street batsman playing against an international fast bowler you know the chances of winning are right from the beginning 
not there or it's like you know a, a street kid who is just learning boxing having to play a boxing match against mike tyson or uh, someone like that who is a international gym. it was right from the beginning it was rigged so when it was rigged that and the rigging was done by people who were evil so it was duryodhan who was evil and dhritarashtra who was like a puppet for him so if we consider in terms of villains you know the duryodhan is the active villain and dhritarashtra is the passive villain so both of them together did something so when d- d- let this terrible thing happen <coughs> now did krishna allow it to happen yes without krishna sanction upadrashta anumanta cha without krishna allowing it nothing would have happened but did krishna make duryodhan and dhritarashtra come up with the gambling plan no that was their own evil so the disastrous gambling match hmm? if we consider they are trying to understand how things happen in this world the disastrous gambling match was it due to yudhishthir's free will yes definitely was it due to duryodhan's evil yes definitely isn't it is it ultimately krishna's will in the sense that the will means here more of permission yes it is krishna's will also so now the point here is that depending on what perspective we are taking now when we analyze situations we need to analyze and find out what is the actionable cause over here that which is the cause i want to act on at this particular time hmm. do i want to act on the cause oh it was my mistake and i need to learn and improve or oh, it is this evil person doing this and i have to fight against this evil person it it is god's will god allowed it to happen so i accept it so here uh, i now i will so we will we'll talk about these three factors and how these three factors when we consider which factor we will different courses of action will need to be taken and those will be discussing in tomorrow session but right now i'll make one last point i will talk about the role of kala because what does kala mean actually here in this context that there is time as a factor so earlier i discussed the statement about destiny being fixed hmm. or rather uh, destiny fixing our happiness and distress and yet does that mean our present actions don't have any consequence at all no it doesn't mean like that i'll explain how this works in two terms hmm. so destiny and we are talking about destiny and kala their relationship but in terms of our actions that is our free will and in terms of others actions which i will summarize here as evil now that does not mean that our actions can never be evil and it doesn't mean the other actions other actions are always evil i'm just simplifying it over here our actions means here we can say the pandavas for example mm-hmm. and others are kauravas over here. so let's take a simple example and then we'll move to a uh, a more historical uh, the mahabharata example say suppose now say when we begin our life journey so we all carry some daiva daiva is basically like the accumulation of our past karma say assuming right now let's focus on the negatives because we are talking about distress that is going to come in our lives say suppose somebody has minus 400 you cannot quantify karma like that but just for our purposes that means 
there are 400 units of negative karma that a person has and say based on that if this is their life during that time you know, they are going to have four adversities that they are going to face maybe one adversity could be they suddenly fired from their job another adversity is maybe they are cheated by some relative with finances maybe another adversity is that they have lost they lose some loved one another adversity is that they get some terrible disease they have an accident or a disease so assume that these four big problems are going to come in their lives now when these problems come it's very difficult to deal with these problems but imagine if these four problems come all nearly at the same time isn't it it's like we lose our job and we have invested some money in a stock market and we find that whole that in stock that whole thing is a ponzi scheme at that same time say you know we get some cancer and at that same time our life partner divorces and goes away if all four come at the same time it would be unbearable isn't it so it's our own karma coming to us but when it comes to us can make a significant difference now suppose say in this life i am going to have the each of we all have some karma which is going to come to us but suppose somebody is learns to be polite and courteous and helpful in their relationships then what may happen is even if one person abandons them and goes away they have cultivated relationships because of which others will be there to help them hmm? suppose somebody has learned financial responsibility that means it is that they earn money and they spend it all and they often spend more than they would earn now that is being they may be earning a lot but they are spending more than what they earn and they are financially irresponsible then what happens they will be in big trouble if if they lose their job or if their investment goes off but if they learn financial responsibility so either i am talking of courteous behavior or financial responsibility they are basically characteristics of sattva guna then what hap may happen is that yeah they may lose the money they may lose their job they may lose their savings they lose their investment but they they have cultivated a habit so they will have some so if they are financially responsible they won't put all their money in one place in the hope of getting big gains they will diversify that's common sense you could say it's intelligence it's common sense it's sattva guna so on the other hand say suppose somebody is suppo uh, supposed to get some cancer now they get that cancer but if throughout their life they have eaten in a regulated way they have practiced uh, good habits like exercise or health then they will have good Im immunity relatively speaking and their chances of battling with the cancer will be better so the point is that even if our past karma is fixed but kala will play a significant role in how that karma in unfolds in our life so that means whenever that karma is going to come that is a bad kal for us so now sometimes they sometimes astrologers may your shani is here and your mangal is here and all those things now the the way we sometimes speak it it's as if shani or mangal are causing the problems to us it is not saturn or mars that cause the problems it is they are indicative of our own past karmas reactions coming to us at a particular time hmm. so it's uh, so now the point is that kala plays a significant role and during some kala it may be that some negative reactions are coming to us but that kala may get aggravated because of our actions and then things can become far worse than what they need to be so <clears throat> that means say you could we could say the the kala factor on one side is associated with purva karma 
So it is associated with purva karma. By, because of our past actions, we are going to suffer certain things. But if that, now that can, the purva karma, it can minus present karma. That means what? Say, by my past karma, I'm going to have a terrible misunderstanding with someone. And two good friends are going to have a misunderstanding by which they, they are going to quarrel and they are going to fight. But if my present karma is such that I have been responsible, I have, I have been sensitive, I have been respectful, I have been kind, then what will happen is, the result will be, the problem will be lesser. Because my present karma is in one sense subtracting from the past karma. On the other hand, my present karma could add to the past karma. I have a quarrelsome nature, I have quarrel with everyone. Whenever problems come, my solution is to outshout the other person. Like some people, they think that if there is an argument, I need to improve my, the content of my argument. Others think, I need to the, raise the volume of my voice. Or if raising the volume of my voice doesn't work, I will start raising my fists. Well, if they start thinking like that, then what will happen is, the result in terms of the problem can worsen. So, with the Kala will determine that how our present actions should be. Hmm? I am not endorsing astrology over here because each astrologer can have their own idiosyncrasies. And, but the point is, when some astrologers say this is a bad phase for you, you know, don't make any major decisions in your life, don't invest money, don't do this, don't do that. What is the point over there? The, the implication behind that is that there can be phases that are bad for us. Hmm? So during that, those bad phases, if we are careless, the problems will become worse. Say somebody, uh, by, uh, by some past karma, they are meant to meet, meet some road accident. Now if at that time, if they have a habit of driving carefully and they see from the opposite side, somebody is just coming, swerving, you know, shakily driving. Probably that driver is drunk. Then what do you do? You try to stop your car or move your car out of the way or stop your car and get out of the car. Now that person may come and hit our car. We may get injured but we may not get that much injured. But say imagine that person is drunk and we are also drunk. <laughs> there it is going to be a drunken disaster. Isn't it? So it's like drunk square. <laughs> so it will be a problem raised to the power of two. So the point I'm making is Kala can affect Ka the, when Kala is going, we are going through a particular Kala, our own actions will make a significant difference. Not an entire difference, the accident may still happen, but it will make a significant difference. Hmm. The second point is, with which I will conclude this, Kala and others' actions. So, here, so this is really the launch point for our discussion tomorrow. In the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna analyzes how he does not control everything. This controllership of Krishna, I will talk about more in tomorrow's session also. But the Krishna used the example in 9.6, Yatha Kashasthito Nityam Vayu Sarvatra Gomahan Tatha Sarvani Bhutani Matsthani Tyopadharaya So he says that you know, if you consider the sky, to be like an upside down bowl. Then, if the sky is like an upside down bowl, then he says that the wind can move up and down, left and right within the, peri within the perimeter of the sky. But it cannot move beyond the sky. So like that, we can say each one of us, you know, by our purva karma, we have a particular kshetra. So this we can call as the Kshetra. Kshetra is the area of influence. Mm -hmm. So for everyone, there is a particular Kshetra. The Kshetra can change with Kala also. If somebody may, somebody may born in a royal family. But if they are just a prince right now, they have some power. But in future they become king, they have much more power. Isn't it? So for example, say somebody when they are a child, they may have this much kshetra. When they become, if that person becomes the king, their kshetra may much big, become much bigger. 
then afterwards they become old and they are no longer on the throne the kshetra again goes down so the kshetra the sphere of influence that a person has can change with time now sometimes say so there is a this is where i'm talking about the factor of the person is evil the person is a terrible person and now if somebody else happens to come in their kshetra hmm, say some somebody was a jew who was born in germany at the time when hitler was ruling now what happens is they come under the kshetra under the sphere of influence of hitler at that time now hitler by his past karma was meant to be a powerful king now he could have been a powerful ruler powerful head of state for good or for bad now he chose to do it all for a terrible purpose but he had that option he got that power he could have used it for good he could have used it for bad now when he got that power and he used it for bad that was that led to other people becoming victimized now when the other person is victimized you know it is horrible and at such a time the intelligent thing to do is not to point out or intelligent or sensitive thing to do is not to emphasize oh you know you must have done the, all those people must have done some bad karma because of which they suffered well that is not the relevant factor at that particular point nobody tells for example dropadi that you know you must have have done some bad karma because of which you suffered the humiliation of being disrobed no that may be a factor but that is not the relevant factor that the relevant factor is dushasan did a horrible thing and dushasan deserves to be punished but the point is while a person has some power then if say if we happen to be going through their kshetra hmm? so say you know we we work in a company and the way the things work out is that we come under a particular boss maybe we have to work with a particular boss and that boss is known to be very demanding very rude a very has no respect for boundaries any time the person calls and demands now maybe for 6 months we have to work under that boss and after that we might go into another team we might go into another project or during those 6 months that is our kala we are in the kshetra of that person and when we are in the kshetra of that person we have to deal with it so when here bishma will say that i consider this all to be the result of kala now kala is also working under the control of the lord but what happens in that phase is not necessarily directly caused by god that kala is coming in our life because of our bad our past our misuse of free will <coughs> or it is coming because of some evil that someone is doing so what is what is coming because of kala it is not independent of god but that doesn't mean it is caused by god so for such kala we have to do we have to accept that bad things happen even to good people that's why when he is giving all these examples that all these points that yudhishthira is so virtuous you are so powerful and krishna is with you but still bad things happen so so now for most of us krishna is not there visibly with us but the mahabharata example shows that even when krishna is directly with some person still bad things can happen to that person so the point is in this world nobody is immune from bad things happening and so the question that the scriptures they ask the 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 question that we'll be exploring in the next session that is the, the question is why do bad things happen to good people and that is a valid question and it can be answered using the philosophy of karma and other things but the bha- this is not the this is not the focus of the bhagavad gita and in general for most people who are suffering 
this is not the most important question that when bad things happen what do good people do when bad things happen what do good people do this is a much more constructive question to ask hmm. if somebody is suffering there's no point at that time in getting into past karma not no point most of the times it's not very helpful it is sometimes karma can be an explanation but the more important thing is what is the way we can help them right now hmm. i met one a devotee in in new zealand and the devotee is telling you know that devotee's sister had committed suicide now suicide is a terrible thing somebody that you know emotionally they must have been so so tormented that they felt death is better than living but you know there's a whole thing called a survivors syndrome or survivors trauma that do when somebody commits suicide those who survive them they face great trauma you know did i do something that pushed this person over the edge mm-hmm. one of my friends is telling me that one day he was just chanting and he had his phone with him and one of his counselors sent a message please accept my final obeisances <laughs> 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 it's such an alarming thing to get a message like that what happened <laughs> now <laughs> so you know it is like from one side did i do anything that pushed the person over the edge or the other is could i have done something to prevent it so you know this is the trauma that the survivors go through so now at that time if all that we draw from our philosophy and we tell who has committed suicide has become a ghost so it's like we are adding to the trauma of the survivor over there is it now yes somebody who uh, destroys their body prematurely then they won't get an ex body immediately and during that intermediate intermediate phase they will have to stay in a disembodied state and this that disembodied state is called a state of being a ghost but now this point is relevant to deter people from committing suicide you know if somebody thinks you know oh, all my problems i'll end by ending my life well it's not that simple isn't it it doesn't work like that so that is for somebody who is who may be thinking of that you know don't do it you know it is you'll be in a further state of suffering but for somebody who has lost a loved one at that time talking about oh you know you have they have become a ghost is not very helpful mm. so at that time the most important thing is that okay i told that you know okay whatever has happened you know they are souls and even for a soul the parmatma is with that person is in parmatma doesn't abandon anyone parmatma doesn't abandon anyone ghosts also the lord is there so he said that you know now you whatever has happened you just focus on strengthening your relationship with god strengthen your relationship with krishna practice bhakti and you heal from that wound that what has happened it has happened we can't change it but what do we do now how do we move forward was it because of our bad action did we do something we don't know this how much should we hold ourselves responsible when bad things happen how much we should see things as beyond our control like prabhupada says in the last sentence of this purport there is no use there is no the purport has gone now there is no use to lament when things are beyond our control okay we'll go back that when things are beyond human control there is no use of lamenting so there are times when trying to analyze was it my mistake was it this person's mistake that may not be the most helpful thing so how to function in such situations we'll be discussing in tomorrow's session in fact tomorrow so today it's not so much a 
it's not so much a co some clear directive for action but it is more a underst appreciating the complexity and the nuance of the situation so i'll summarize what we discussed today basically our whole analysis was trying to understand kal as the cause of adversity what does it mean basically because that's what the section was going to talk about so in that connection we started by discussing how karma doesn't seem to explain that they all had done good karma so it's like it was three factors were there in their favor they had skill which is their present karma they had punya piety that was their past karma and they had god's mercy so prabhupad says material and spiritual resources both were there on their side and still they were suffering so uh, so at such times it's natural question why adversity so karma sim karma can seem too simplistic at this time and in that connection i discussed how paradoxes how things are complex that we, if we just reduce everything to very simple things the paradoxes were given to illustrate complexity of reality that sometimes there are statements in scripture which tell opposite thing so the three things i discussed the examples of complexity was that happiness and distress are destined but then still our choices hmm? sattva can increase happiness and say tamas or even rajas to some extent can bring can increase distress so that is also true so like that we discussed multiple hmm, fixed life span versus ayurveda and then maya adhyakshin prakriti versus nadatte kasya chit papa so god controls everything and god does not control everything so our whole point was we can't just take one statement from scripture and absolutize it so for all suffering it's your own karma we can't take that kind of over simplified approach so when problems come we discuss problems can uh broadly it is ultimately nothing happens without god's will but as god's will there is free will and then there is evil and we need to consider which is the relevant factor when for understanding what's happening so based on then then i talked about la finally with this uh and a whole analysis we talked about kala kala means that when we are going through a bad phase that bad phase could be because of our own past karma that our destiny may come upon us and then how we act can either uh, alleviate alleviate means minimize the effect or aggravate and then the bad phase can come also because of so here when you are talking about the bad phase this is largely free will it is up to us to how do we face the bad phase but then the bad phase can also come because of evil evil means others actions so others kshetra we are temporarily passing through that kshetra and when we are passing through that kshetra at that time during that phase we may have to suffer so the focus needs to be on hmm, not why this happened but what to do how do when bad things happen to good people uh, what what do good people do so what do the what does bhishma recommend yudhishthir to do that we'll be discussing in tomorrow's session thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions or comments
Yes, bro. So I'm afraid many of the questions may have to be answered. Wait, we will have to wait for the answers tomorrow. But you can ask the question, uh, but be ready to wait for the answer tomorrow. Because I'm not going to give tomorrow's class today. Okay, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you for this divine lecture. So as you told that uh, uh, if we come in contact with an evil person under their circle of influence, uh, so uh, that can aggravate, aggravate our bad karma. So I don't think it aggravates our bad karma. It just it aggravates our bad situation. Okay, yes, bad not situation. our bad karma. Hmm. Unless like, we associate with them and we also become evil. <laughs> That's a different situation. Yes, yes. Yeah. So in case of Jews, they had no choice actually. If we see at a bigger perspective, so what's their fault in that case? That they had to come in contact with a person like Hitler? Well, see, from a, if you want to take a purely rational perspective, yes, why does one person come under the kshetra of another person? Hmm? That is by karma. Right? Say, somebody is born at a time when a very good king is ruling. Why is that? That's because of good karma. Somebody is born at a time when, uh, when uh, and a, t a tyrant, a dictator is ruling. That's because of bad karma. So, this is just a fact of life. But what I was saying is, that may not be the most relevant explanation at that time. We, we don't focus on that. Because where is the, where should the focus be in such a way that we can help someone? Hmm? Our attitude should be, at, at most of the times, should be focused on helping the other person. So, when somebody is suffering, somebody has gone through terrible suffering, we need to focus on how can I help that person. If we only focus on their own karma, if we don't, basically, philosophy without service attitude will make us hard-hearted. Because, say, consider if it's everything, everybody suffers because of their past karma. That is true. But if I take this and I don't have a service attitude, then where am I going to stop? Say, for example, a mother has a newborn baby. And the newborn baby is crying. Now, should the mother think this baby is crying because of her own past karma? No. The mother should have a service attitude. Isn't it? That's a, uh, it is her mother's duty itself. I have to take care of my child. Now sometimes, in spite of the best care taken by the ch mother, still the baby may have some disease because of the baby keeps, which is the baby keeps crying. Now that we can say is because of, that's beyond our control, that's past karma. So philosophy without service attitude can make us hard-hearted and it can make us terribly irresponsible. If say, somebody, if we are robbed, some thieves come into our house and rob everything from us and we go to the police and the police say it was your own past karma isn't it because you are robbed well yeah no well, that may be my past karma but right now the question is what is your present dharma <laughs> isn't it <laughs> so your present dharma is you are taking a salary and that is to maintain law and order over here so your present dharma is what is important hmm? If a husband doesn't have a res doesn't have take responsibility family doesn't have a job and doesn't earn money and the wife says you know we are living in great difficulty he says you know it is your own karma no it is your dharma or consider the opposite you know if the wife doesn't cook food very well and the husband comes back home after a hard job a day's work and he says where is the food is chapati not cooked properly it's your own karma <laughs> no it's your dharma that is important over there. Isn't it? So that is the point. Yes, please. Hare Krishna Bhaji, thank you so much for this detailed lecture, wonderful class. <coughs> Prabhuji, as you explained that uh, how Kal acts in our life or how Kal works, but as we also I have heard from the scriptures that uh, Kal acts differently in case of devotees and non devotees. So I want to ask that how it acts differently, what is the difference? How that Kal? Will, that Krishna's role will be discussed about tomorrow. Kal itself doesn't act differently. Kal acts symmetrically. But Krishna gives us strength to respond to Kala differently. See, if you consider Kala as a, as a material factor. See, there is always the relationship of Veda and Abheda. 
difference and non difference so if we consider kala as say the changing of seasons now if it is very hot it is going to be hot for devotees it is going to be hot for non devotees also isn't it the summer heat is not going to act differently for devotees and non devotees but somebody who is extremely in bodily consciousness they will feel tormented by it now devotees who are not so much in bodily consciousness will still be inconvenienced by it but maybe they are not so troubled by it so it's not so much kala acts differently it's more that the way we respond to it is different can kala act different that's also possible but we don't have to expect or insist or demand that it act differently the more focus is more on that we respond differently okay yes hari krishna prabhu ji there are two things uh, when i heard of, heard from you there are two things coming to my mind one is like you said there are three things one is the god's wills one's own free will and others will like then there are two two things happen like one is that in our life uh, by our free will we can do good or bad similarly others will they can also try the same thing so that creates a situation in our life but then sometimes uh, that is what we are suffering or enjoying by that process but when we see the mahabharat where pandavas kauravas are there and lord krishna was also there and we say it is been orchestrated by krishna's leela that the way people behave was designed by krishna so my my point is how do we jump from one set of uh, things happening like our will and others will versus something totally happening by god will how do we jump from one to other so how do, so that's what i talked about the four levels at which scripture can be understood so there is the ethical level and there's a devotional level see i don't think we can jump from one to another it's like we take two different perspectives if you want to focus on the devotional perspective focus on the devotional perspective and then yes it's all arranged by the lord and we relish it as the lord's pastime but if you want to look at it from the ethical perspective then focus on the ethical perspective and then if we suddenly jump from the at one moment we are talking about the ethical and the next moment we jump to the devotional that doesn't work it's like say if we are authority figure and if somebody has not done their service properly and we chastise that person left and right you know you didn't do this you didn't do this you don't do this and you know that same person comes and tells you know okay i wanted to do the service but this person was supposed to help and this person didn't help and at that time you say no see it as krishna's arrangement no that means when i make a mistake you to blame me for it but when somebody else has made a mistake you say see it as krishna's arrangement that is being inconsistent now you we may say that you know that person has that particular nature and that person is working on improving it but they keep making mistakes like this but if we simply start using philosophy selectively then people feel they may not immediately realize it but they will feel uncomfortable they will get alienated so we have to be consistent mm. uh so yes should we try to see things from the perspective of krishna's hand of course but does that mean that we don't look at immediate factors no when prabhupada was trying to get the juhu temple mm. and this mr n was opposing it did prabhupada say oh, it's all krishna's arrangement if krishna doesn't want this temple to come to us what can we do no prabhupada focus on the practical level ethical level he said that we have given the money this person is supposed to give us the land either prabhupada said either you give us our money back and take the land deal or you give us the full land deed and we take the full money from us you are taking the money from us and then driving us away that's not that's not ethically right so if we start jumping from one to another there has to be a proper reason and explanation for that otherwise it can just come off as very self serving so when you make a mistake you it's your punishment it's your problem when i make a mistake it is krishna's plan for your purification no <laughs> that would work properly okay, so so 
that now can we look at things from a practical perspective yes we can because the scriptures themselves do this when the if you the, read the mahabharat nowhere in the mahabharat does krishna say you do this because it is my instruction to you krishna reasons so when krishna tells bhima to hit duryodhan below the thigh or below the waist on the thigh no after that balram and even the devtas they get angry or devtas protest basically balram gets angry now krishna doesn't say i am god how dare you question my will krishna makes a reasoning based on the context over there so is the is the ethical reasoning the only approach to look at this past times no but is the ethical reasoning approach completely inapplicable well if we say it's completely inapplicable then there will be nothing for us to learn in that through any of the scriptural past times in my understanding is prabhupad takes the devotional approach prabhupad also takes the ethical approach so even in respect to prabhupad's past times now can we say all of prabhupad's uh, extraordinary outreach and success was arranged by the lord yes it is true but that does that not mean that we can't learn something from prabhupad when prabhupad was trying so vigorously to share bhakti in india it was not working prabhupad didn't just passively say okay accept it as krishna gave prabhupad did something revolutionary radical courageous he said i'll go to america and i will try to make american people devotees now why because prabhupad said indians are attracted by the infatuated with the west west what does it mean indians are infatuated with the white skin basically so now indians being in, infatuated by the white skin is maya isn't it but prabhupad used one brand of maya to counter another brand of maya isn't it <laughs> so one brand of maya is what that oh you know this whole krishna con this whole bhakti this whole bhagavad gita it is all all old fashioned it is irrelevant for us today another brand of maya is oh the white skin people are so intelligent they are so expert they are so successful now prabhupada is directly tried to counter you know tell and explain how the bhagavad gita is relevant but people are not ready to take it so prabhupada went to the west so now the point i'm making is that can we not analyze like this that okay prabhupada tried at one level when it didn't work he didn't take it as simply as krishna's will he analyzed and he arrived at a particular decision and then he focused on applying that strategy so the ethical approach can also be used the transcendental approach can also be used but but your point is well taken that I'll, that you know when we are dealing with sacred characters hmm, our focus should not be so much on who is right because we don't want to be judging great characters our focus should be more on what is right Mm-hmm. so if you see in the chitraketu past time for example when chitraketu laughs uh, on seeing uh, parvati sitting on the lap of uh, lord shiva so at that time sometimes prabhupada takes uh, takes uh, parvati uh, par- perspective says in the chitraketu when he saw that there were great sages sitting over there none of them was objecting why did he have to object to that but then afterwards when chitraketu very gracefully accepts the curse and then narayana parasar that verse comes about how a devotee should be equipoised at that time prabhupada takes from the perspective of uh, in favor of chitraketu he says that when on when chitraketu laughed lord shiva was not disturbed the sages were not disturbed so why did parvati have to become so angry so was the, the cursing uh, wrong was the laughing wrong the point is that our focus is not so much on whether this particular action was wrong or right our focus is more on that what we can learn about right and wrong action from that situation okay thank you very much one last question we'll have okay there are a lot of questions one last question will be here Hare Krishna Prabhu ji thank you for such a wonderful class 
Ruji, my question is, you explained, like in example of uh, Draupadi's disrobing, there were three factors, uh, Yudhishthira's free will, uh, Duryodhana's free will, and Krishna's will in the form of permission that he allowed. So Prabhuji, can we understand some example where uh, Krishna's permission was not there, and then what happened? In that incident happened or it didn't happen? See, Krishna's intention may not be there, but without Krishna's permission, nothing can happen. Like, for example, when Krishna went as a Shanti Dut, as a peace messenger, you know, Duryodhana rejected his peace proposal. So Krishna's desire was that the war be avoided. But Yudhishthir, but Duryodhana was just so adamant that he just didn't listen. So, can things happen against God's will? Well, it depends. The will, when we use the word will, Will can mean God's intention. So can people do things which God doesn't want them to do? Of course they can. But can people do things which is against God's permission? No. That nobody can do. So without that, that permission is like the sky. Say for example, right now no, you can get angry, I can get angry. Maybe if I can get, I get angry, I may yell at someone. If you get angry, maybe you can yell at someone, you can hit someone. But our anger cannot destroy a whole city. Right? But the president of America or the president of Russia, they get angry, they can press one button and the entire city can be nuked. So that is the kshetra they have right now. So now why do they have that, that, that level of influence? That is by Krishna's will. And there is a kala when they will have it. They will have it for a tenure. Uh, sometimes 5 years, 10 years, sometimes a particular head of state might be there for 20, 30, 50 years. But eventually that kala is going to end. So nothing happens without Krishna's permission. Okay. So thank you very much. Granthraj, Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaurabhatta Vrindakisha.